All right. Well, welcome everyone to this evening that I am super excited about. My name is Cassandra Veaton. I am the Director of Research and Development at the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination at the University of California, San Diego. We're welcoming you here from Passion Island, which was built by our partners, Origami Air. This is actually the sunroom on Passion Island. You'll see behind us is a bamboo forest. Um, and outside, you can see a beautiful ocean view. There are several parts of the island, and um, we've built it for training healthcare professionals and others in compassion and helping to reduce stress and now. So it's really exciting to have this event here and to be streaming out to all of you live from VR. For those of you who are not familiar with the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination, this is a institute, a center at UCSD, which seeks to understand, enhance, and enact the gift of imagination by bringing together the inventive power of science and technology with the critical analysis of the humanities and the expressive insight of the arts. In plainer language, we try to understand what imagination is, where it comes from, what the neural correlates of it are, how we can use it, what tools will help to encourage it. And then we create communities and environments where youth and adults, innovators, engineers, scientists, and uh, everyday folks can use their imagination to envision new futures for humanity that are more regenerative and sustainable. So thanks for being here. And now it's my real honor um, to actually introduce one of my role models, um, somebody that I'm kind of, he didn't know it when we were meeting before this, but I was kind of super fangirling as I was um, in here meeting David Chalmer. Uh, David is a philosopher at New York University at NYU. He's a university professor at philo of philosophy and neuroscience and the co-director of the Center for Mind Brain Consciousness. He's also an honorary professor of philosophy at the Australian National University and co-director of the Phil Papers Foundation. He's interested in the philosophy of mind, especially consciousness, and the foundations of cognitive science, physics, and technology, as well as the philosophy of language, metaphysics, epistemology, and many other areas. Most important for tonight, he's the author of the just published book, Reality Plus, Virtual Worlds and the Problems of Philosophy. David Chalmers, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thanks, Cassie. It's such a great pleasure to uh, to be here live in VR. You know, this book of mine is all about virtual reality, so it seems totally appropriate to be uh, doing this event this way. And great to be here. We've got, you know, many or so people standing around in uh, in VR inside the room and uh, in this beautiful space, which has been designed and more of you out there on Zoom. Hey, everyone. Yeah, thanks so much, Cassie. Wonderful. Well, you know, let's just launch right in. So after having read your book, we could say that maybe some people would think who are out there in Zoom land, they're coming to us from a fake environment. They're coming to us from an environment that's not real. But the premise of your book is that virtual environments actually are real. Talk a little bit about that. Help us understand that. Yeah, the uh, the slogan of Reality Plus is a uh, virtual reality is genuine reality. It's a you know, there's a common attitude of holding that virtual worlds like this one are somehow fake or fictional. They're illusions. I guess the idea would be that yeah, there seems to be a space here we're all in, and there seems to be a building and all these avatars, and none of them are real. That's not my view. I think that actually we're in a digital space where the objects out there are digital objects, ultimately made of processes on a computer made of bits, but they're no less real for all that. There really are some avatars out there in front of me. It really is a virtual space that we're all in. It really is a virtual building that we're inside. It's a, it's a digital object. It's made of bits. But that doesn't make it any less real than being made, say, of 
atoms. I want to argue that in principle, the digital re virtual reality is a different kind of reality from physical reality. It's no less real for all that. I also want to argue that, you know, we can have perfectly meaningful interactions in a virtual world. In fact, I think we're having a meaningful interaction right now. But more than that, I think people can lead meaningful lives in principle inside a virtual world. We've already seen this with virtual worlds like, say, Second Life, where people um, people build relationships, they build communities, they work there, they play there. Once we do this in inside actual virtual reality in a three-dimensional immersive world, then I think you know there's no block in principle to leading a fully meaningful life in virtual reality in uh, in many of the same ways that people do in physical reality. So yeah, I want to say virtual reality is genuine reality. Zoom, I'm not so sure about. Zoom is video conferencing, not yet quite virtual reality. It's a communication tool. But once you actually bring in you know, real virtual environments like this one, then I think we're on the road to full-scale reality. OK, wonderful. Thanks, David. Well, I'm, I hear that I'm echoing, and I need to mute. And so I am uh working on finding my mute button can you hear me now david i can hear you yeah okay how about now yep, I hear you. okay well uh trisha maybe you can send me a note about how to mute when i'm in megaphone mode uh thank it's you flipping in and out a little bit for me now but i still hear you all right great um so you've said in your book, VR can be an illusion machine, but it need not be an illusion machine and it isn't simply an illusion machine. Instead, it generates virtual worlds and can allow you to correctly perceive them. When it does this, it's actually a reality machine. Yeah, there's a lot of tradition again of thinking VR is a kind of an illusion. I think VR can generate illusions. The psychologist well, Slater talks about, who's one of the leading experts on VR and someone I've talked a lot with, talks about VR as by its nature involving an illusion. He calls it the place illusion, the illusion that I'm right now in this place, in this building, plausibility illusion, illusion that all these things are happening. I want to say that none of these things are actually illusions. Well, they needn't be illusions. Maybe the first time you use VR, you put a VR headset on, and maybe you don't even realize you're in VR. You think you're in a physical world, a physical environment, and I see hey, this, uh, this guy in front of me, and I might think, oh my gosh, there's someone in front of me in physical space. Well, that would be an illusion. There's no one necessarily in front of me in physical space. I think for the sophisticated user of VR, once you're used to VR, you, you perceive the world you're interacting with as virtual. What you perceive is not that all this is going on in a physical space, you perceive that all this is going on in virtual space. And there are some virtual bodies, a virtual building in virtual space. And I'm going to say that's actually all going on. There really are digital virtual bodies in a digital virtual building in digital virtual space. Well, I don't want to say we're misperceiving or having an illusory perception of a fake reality. I want to say I'm correctly perceiving virtual reality. These are, yeah, that's the sense in which VR is actually a kind of reality machine. David, in your book, you talked about kind of five elements that help people know when something is, quote, real or not real. Um, share with us a few of those elements and, and how can we use that to think about reality in VR? Yeah, I mean, this all goes back to a... Uh, an issue that comes up in the end, the first Matrix movie. Uh, Neo says, none of this is real. And then Morpheus says, what is real? How do you define real? Okay, this is great for a philosopher because that's such a philosophical question. How do you define real? And the word real, I've been throwing it around left and right already, but it doesn't have one fixed meaning. We use the word real to mean so many different things. And I isolate a few different meanings of the word real in this book, Reality Plus. I mean, one thing, one criterion we use for being real is the idea that something is real and it makes a difference when it affects things in the world, but it has causal powers. So, you know, maybe Joe Biden is real because he can affect 
um, you know, what really happens in the uh, in the U.S. today, whereas maybe Santa Claus, sorry, spoiler alert, is a is not real. Um, maybe the idea of Santa Claus is real makes a difference, but Santa Claus himself, not real. So that's one, having causal powers. And I would argue digital objects like avatars and buildings and and treasures and so on, they can actually all make a difference within the virtual world. So they're real too. Another criterion, something is real if it's not all in the mind. If something's totally all in the mind, we treat it as maybe it's real in some sense, but it's less real. It's not out there independent of us. So maybe say a dream is not like, what happens in a dream is not entirely real because it's happening inside your mind. But on the other hand, the physical world, I think is out there independent of our minds. And the same goes for this virtual world as digital processes here, which don't depend on my mind. I could, I could leave completely in this, uh, this room, all of us could leave in this digital room would still be here. Uh, third is the idea of not being an illusion, which I already touched on. You might think that if you perceive something in an illusory way, so it seems to be a certain way, and it's not that way. For example, if it seemed to me there are a lot of people here and there aren't a lot of people here, and that would be an illusion. So this wouldn't be real. I actually think, as I said before, I think I am correctly perceiving this space. There really are, there really is a virtual building here. There really are people in this virtual room, virtually body. And I see, I, I see them out there raising their hands now. You guys are really here in this virtual space. We really are all here together virtually. So again, not an illusion. Finally, that there is an issue about whether, you know, whether, for example, uh, this chair over here is a real chair or whether I say a virtual kitten, if we see one here, is a real kitten. This is like when we attach the word real to a certain kind of thing. Uh, like is it, you say, okay, I'm wearing a, uh, a watch. Is it a real watch? Yes, it's a real watch. Is it a real Rolex? I don't know, maybe it's just a fake Rolex. So this is like the real X notion. This is kind of authenticity. I think authenticity is a little bit more complicated. I'm not sure I want to say that that chair over there that I'm, uh, that I'm into, those chairs are real chairs. Maybe we'd say, at least for now, we'd say they're virtual chairs and not real chairs. We could come to use the word chair more, more inclusively so that food chairs like this as real chairs. That would be what I call virtual inclusive language. But I don't necessarily want to claim that you know virtual objects count as the authentic, um, especially if we count like, a real X as the original X. Okay, well, virtual, virtual Xs are often copies of the original Xs. So that's the one place where I think virtual reality can fall short of physical reality. Um, there are, but there are actually, there turn out to be many cases where virtual Xs do count as real Xs. And one this case I discuss a lot in the book is just say we're in a virtual reality our whole lives, so-called simulation hypothesis. Then, in fact, these chairs and tables around us, ones we, in, we interact with normally, have been virtual chairs and tables our whole lives. And in that case, I want to say, yeah, well, it turns out that real chairs and real tables are virtual chairs and virtual tables. Anyway, those are some of the different meanings of reality that I try and disentangle over the course of the book. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm particularly interested in this idea of genuineness or, or authenticity that, you know, I, I feel like the people mm -hmm. there's a concern that because anything can happen in a way in here that one could be tricked, you know, one could be um, hoodwinked or um, brainwashed somehow by, you know, alternative facts, shall we say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there, are, there is the potential of using VR for deception. Like one extreme case would be, say, kidnapping somebody from physical reality, putting them in virtual reality. And let's say this is really advanced VR technology. It's indistinguishable from physical reality, not telling them. They're in, uh, they're in virtual reality, and then they'd acquire all kinds of false beliefs about what's going on. It's like, oh my God, what's, uh, what's, uh, what's happening now? Maybe this could be used for political purposes or 
whatever. This is kind of, you know, this, we all know deep fake technology where photos and videos can already be constructed to convince you that something is, something happened when it wasn't. You know, deep fake VR gets in principle all the more serious. So I do think it's going to be important as we increasingly interact with virtual objects for us to know what's physical and what's virtual. This actually becomes a really serious issue when it comes to using so-called mixed reality technology or augmented reality technology. Maybe I've got some uh, augmented reality glasses that project virtual objects into the world along with the, uh, the physical objects in the world. And you know, the technology could have been, right now, right now you can normally tell when an object is virtual. It's a little bit cartoonish like these, like these avatars here. It's kind of clear, but as it gets, the technology gets better, maybe it'll eventually get harder to know. I think we're still going to, to want to know. I think it's very important to us to have this sense of virtuality. So we perceive virtual objects as virtual and the sense of physicality. So we perceive physical objects as physical. So I think maybe it's for ethical use of virtual reality and augmented reality. I think users are going to demand that somehow that virtual objects somehow be identified as virtual, physical objects somehow be identified as physical. So you know, actually, you know, what you're interacting with in what world these things are, are happening. But I think that's, that's actually going to be a very natural thing, very, very natural way for the technology to develop. I mean, and as with, it's going to be possible that people don't obey these ethical constraints, then I think you're going to want to avoid you know, unethical VR of this kind, just as we right now try to avoid, say, unreliable websites. Mostly we'll stick to, okay, you'll read, say, uh, I don't know, the New York Times or a publication known to be reliable and stay away from unreliable sources. I think something might, like that may apply to virtual worlds as well. Well, because we're hosting this um, from the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination, I wanted to bring in the topic of imagination and mm. you know there's this kind of idea that things that are imaginary are not important however people who have invented well probably everything invented almost everything invented that adv has advanced humanity started off with someone entertaining the impossible or exploring potential realities inside of the mind and i'm just curious about your thoughts you know, when does something sort of hit that threshold of being real or let's say being valuable, being important? Those are three different questions I understand, but how does the, how do you think about imagination and the sort of the importance of be, having the skill of entertaining the improbable? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, you guys are much more expert on imagination than I am, but I think imagination is incredibly important. I mean, it's a really central component of human consciousness. It's what we use to envisage other worlds, worlds other than this one, maybe because we're trying to build a better world, maybe because we're thinking about all the different ways the world could be, maybe we're thinking about uh, future or, or the past. So I think, yeah, imagination has so many roles, but with respect to the question, is it real? I think usually we'd say, you know, if I imagine doing something else, well, I imagine a world where I'd gone into, I don't know, mathematics other than philosophy, or imagine I'd, you know, gone out to a restaurant tonight instead of, um, instead of coming here, then is that real? You would probably say, okay, that's not full scale real and say the way that a virtual world is real. And one reason I guess is that imagination is a product of our minds. So it's, I mentioned the case of a dream before. When you dream, uh, the dream is a product of your mind. It's not out there independently of our minds. So maybe that's one sense in which a dream world is, at least in one sense, less real than a virtual world. Also, um, you know, I'm not sure imagination has dreams and imagination necessarily have all the causal powers, say, of a virtual world. So if you're asking, is an imagined object like I imagine a pink elephant in front of me. Is it real? Probably yeah, not as real as a real pink elephant would be, not even quite as real as a virtual pink elephant. But the imagination itself, the mental act of imagining, that is absolutely real. That is as powerful as anything in reality. So 
So, you know, you mentioned, you know, this is increasingly becoming uh, the metaverse is increasingly a territory that we will be spending time in that, um, you know, we are, are to a certain extent. And what do you see coming in terms of the ways that we'll spend time in the metaverse and what that's going to mean for, you know, human evolution and how we move forward societal advancement? Yeah, you know, the technology now is still early primitive. You know, this isn't bad. Old space is uh, is okay, but in uh, but in five or ten years, we'll have things which are which are much better. Maybe they'll figure out how to actually give us legs, <laughs> and uh, and maybe we'll have you know better contact with our with our bodies. Right now, it's like okay, you get images and sounds, but the treatment of the body, for example, is fairly is fairly primitive. There's no real touch. Um, there's no smell and taste and so on. But you know, those things are going to advance as technology advances. The form factor will improve. So we're not going to be in these big bulky headsets all the time. Maybe we'll use something like glasses that we can switch into mixed mode or VR mode when we want to. And I think, you know, one thing I do fully expect to happen is that you know this will become the new way of the New descendants of social media. Instead of this all happening through the Facebook newsfeed, you know, there will actually be social communities inside uh, inside virtual worlds. Here we have a little mini community right here. So we're on the uh, we're on the path. But increasingly, I think you know, real world activities, physical world activities, will happen in virtual worlds. Communication, entertainment, employment, socialization. And I think you know what's going to happen is it will. Right now, people associate virtual worlds with escapism, with uh, you know, video games and the like, and that's one use of virtual worlds. But I think it's actually going to become the way that we spend much of our time, and that I think is going to require a reevaluation of what happens in virtual worlds. Because you know, I think what happens in virtual worlds is fully serious. You know, I think you can commit crimes in virtual worlds. You can, in principle, assault another person in the virtual world. You can steal virtual thing from virtual objects. Right now, I don't know, the, the legal status, for example, of things like virtual theft and virtual assault is uh, is very murky. But I think as we spend more and more time in the metaverse, and naturally, I think we're going to start treating the metaverse as more and more analogous to physical reality. And I think our legal and moral and philosophical framework is going to have to adapt. Also considered the possibility that you know how genes are expressed in an experience dependent fashion for example so you know while we have a dna as our sort of code we've got tons of gene expression that kind of decides whether to turn on or turn off in response to the environment whether it's a stressful traumatic environment or a peaceful one or a freezing cold one or or other elements so when we're able to put people into environments that we can that are not um, bound by Newtonian physics, do you think there's a sense that these virtual worlds might change who we are? I think it's very possible. I mean, I think already people use virtual worlds sometimes to experiment with, with who they are. For example, People who are experimenting with with gender sometimes will use VR for to, you know to try out to experiment with different kinds of gender expression, and for some of them that's a uh, that's a prelude to uh, to doing something similar in the uh, in the physical world. Some people experiment with totally new forms of embodiment. You go to a place like VR Chat, and there are so many people who are embodied in VR as a cat or as a anime character or something and this is very central i think for some people this can become very central to their expression and their identity and likewise with the worlds we go into yeah, well this world the one we're in right now seems to mostly obey the laws of physics except that there are all these bodies floating above the ground without legs but otherwise it looks like a fairly orthodox world but uh, okay we can we can teleport i won't teleport right now because i'll probably uh I'll probably mess up there we go teleported as I go back, where I am roughly. Right. Yeah. More, more, more or less the right place. Okay. So I, I just violated uh, a law of physics or two. Um, 
But eventually, you know, but there are, there are virtual worlds where you can fly. There are virtual worlds where you can go around outer space. There are virtual worlds where there is no gravity. And I think this is, yeah, ultimately, I think I restrict virtual worlds to being like the, uh, the physical worlds. Virtual worlds will be as broad as our imagination, and that's very broad indeed. Well, one of the things that um, we've been interested in is how we can utilize VR and AR for health and healing. So, you know, one of the issues in, let's say, depression or anxiety is that people imagine the worst um, and they see the worst. They actually perceive the worst. There's these interesting studies uh, that show word completion or sentence completion that the guest uh, end of a sentence stem or the guest middle word, middle letter between M and D might be mud, you know, whereas it could be something different for someone who's not. How do you see virtual worlds being something that could potentially sort of uh, boost what could be called the placebo effect, but could also be called sort of a mind-body healing effect? Yeah, this is super interesting, and I'm not really an expert on clinical applications, but I have talked to people who have um, who do really interesting work with this. A lot of psychologists work with VR. I'm one of the first VR labs I was in was a lab of uh, Dee Moller Tesh in Germany, and she was doing experiments on body image for people with, uh, example, for people with eating disorders, imagine themselves in uh, in different bodies, um, and she found this had very uh, very healthy effects in at least some of them, or healing effects in at least some of them to be able to have to try on different virtual bodies. Also, another um, another application I talked to was um, someone who was working with schizophrenic patients, and somehow they had, you know, all these uh, hallucinatory or these voices, which, you know, would speak to them in their, in their um, schizophrenic states, and they worked with these patients to build like an avatar that would embody some of these uh, these voices. And, you know, this voice that was talking to them and telling them, you're worthless, you're nothing. Well, suddenly it wouldn't be an all-encompassing voice. It would be an avatar in, uh, in front of them saying this. And then they could, somehow that made it easier for them to dismiss this, uh, this, uh, this avatar as something which they shouldn't be taking quite so seriously. So, yeah, the way that virtual worlds can build these new environments and uh, and new realities does seem to be at least potentially very very powerful in in medical and, and health context i think we're probably just at the uh, the beginning of that in your book you have a whole chapter on sort of the mind body issue mm -hmm. and you point out how you know cartesian dualism important um, not completely satisfying not completely um tenable really as a solution and then materialism, uh, in other words, that consciousness or the mind comes directly and only from body processes might also uh, not be perfect. Um, what, what do you think is a better solution to the mind-body problem and how does AR and VR kind of either work, you know, is it relevant to that or built, you know, how can we use it to explore that further? Yeah, so you know, the philosophy of mind is like my own sort of background and home base, thinking about consciousness and the relationship between the mind and the body. And yeah, there are just so many interesting connections between mind body issues and virtual reality. Here's one you mentioned, uh, you mentioned Cartesian dualism. And Cartesian dualism, the mind is not really part of the body. You know, you could, you could cut up a, a body, and according to Descartes, you'd never find the mind inside the body. But look at a virtual world like this one. There's kind of a physics of this virtual world. There are all these physical objects. There are all these, uh, these bodies out there, these, uh, these avatars. But you know, you could, you could cut up this avatar and you will never find uh, even anything like a brain inside, uh, inside this, this avatar. We could, you know, so we go out there and we do the physics of the world. We'll find, okay, there is a physics engine governing this world, there are certain algorithm that govern, algorithms that govern these inanimate processes. Do they govern the behavior of people? We'll find nothing inside this quasi-physical world 
governs the behavior of people like me. I mean, I don't know, non-player characters, maybe, but actual people like us know you. The mind, our mind is not to be found inside this world. Of course, we know where it is. It's in another world, in that physical world that we were, uh, that we were once in and may yet wake up in, in one day. And in the physical world, we're connected up to a headset and somehow we're doing things that guide our behavior in this world. But this world, but this virtual world is very much like the world that Descartes had in mind with his mind-body dualism. Virtual worlds are a world of mind-body dualism. We have, our, we have our bodies here and our minds are elsewhere. This isn't to say that mind-body dualism is true in our ordinary physical world, but virtual worlds do provide a wonderful illustration of how some form of mind-body dualism could be true. And there are so many other kinds of consciousness here. Yeah. Panpsychism has some consciousness everywhere. Sometimes, you know, could a, in, a, in a virtual world, could each of these little entities have their own consciousness? Well, it's no less plausible in a virtual world, I think, than in a physical world. Well, good. I'll ask the folks here in the sunroom to start to contemplate any questions you might have for David. Um, in the meantime, you know, what would you want people to take away from your book? You know, um, we've, we've mentioned a couple of the key messages, um, but what do you want people to leave your book thinking about or, or working on? Well, I want them to be thinking, I think there are just some very deep philosophical issues here to be thinking about, but even more practically, I think these worlds are actually coming. I started thinking about these issues as a philosopher, quite abstractly thinking about Descartes and knowledge of the external world and what is it to be real. And at a certain point, I realized all this actually has very serious application to these uh, to this technology, which is going to be increasingly coming part of our lives. Actually, I've, I've had this happen with philosophy over and over again. Back in the 1990s, Andy Clark and I wrote a paper about how the tools we use can become part of our mind. And I talked about maybe a notebook. Somebody with Alzheimer's might write down things in a notebook and then the notebook is serving as their memory. Well, okay, that was kind of marginal back in the 90s. And then, but then by the 2000s, everyone is suddenly carrying smartphones with them everywhere, mobile computing, wearable computing. And suddenly it's common sense to everybody. The technology we're using has become part of our minds. I think something like this is true for it. That's on the mind side of the equation, but I think something like this is happening for the world as augmented, as virtual reality and augmented reality becomes more central. Issues that were previously just philosophical, like, you know, what is it to be real? What is external reality? Suddenly we have new artificial realities around us and we need to think very seriously about what's their status. Is this genuine reality? Can we live? Uh, a meaningful life. So you don't have to agree with me about those issues, but I think these are issues that everybody should be thinking about. And I would love it if people come away from reading my book by thinking about these ideas, maybe disagreeing with me, maybe building on the ideas further. But I do think these are very rich and important issues to be thinking about. I loved how you said in your book, um, you talked about the power of philosophy and how it's really foundational to so much knowledge. And it also kind of made me think there's a corollary to imagination here. You said, every now and then a philosopher answers a question. Isaac Newton considered himself a philosopher. He worked on philosophical questions about space and time. He figured out how to answer some of them. As a result, the new science of physics emerged. Something similar happened later with economics, sociology, psychology, modern logic, and more all were founded or co-founded by philosophers who got clear enough on some central questions to help spin off a new discipline. So philosophy is an incubator for other disciplines. And we, you know, Eric Veers, he, he's the director of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. We tend to think of that similarly, in, imagination being an incubator for disciplines that are yet to emerge. And one thing I love about what you just said was you know, we have this way now of experientially, immersively, empirically looking into these questions of mind body and relativism. So we don't just have to sort of abstractly think about these things. We can come in and say to ourselves, how does it feel 
to be in relative reality? How does it feel to be separated, feel separated from my body or to have an illusion um, powerfully affect my body? You mentioned in your book, the plank experience, and that was my first experience in VR. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely could not get myself, for those of you who don't know what the plank experience is, you're asked to step onto a plank and have the ground around it drop four stories, and then a very simple instruction, please step off the plank, which for me caused complete cold sweat from top to bottom. And even though I knew there was a real floor in front of me, in quotes, real, I just couldn't bring myself <laughs> to do it. Physical floor, that's what we say. We don't say real. <laughs> that's what I'm, tr I'm trying to that's get. I'm good. trying to get people to use, instead of saying the virtual versus the real, let's say the virtual and the physical. So both real. Yeah, or I think you even said the physical versus the digital. Right. Yeah, physical versus digital. That's another way. That's another way to put it. Yeah, I think hey, you know philosophy. I mean, philosophy is all about the imagination and imagining other worlds and imagining ways things could be. One thing virtual reality does is it starts embodying our imagination. Look at this space we're in now. It was it was part of someone's imagination. I mean, of course, there are many ways of embodying the imagination and fiction and film and theater and so on. But I think VR is giving us kind of a richer way of embodying imagination in something which is really can kind of stand on its own two feet as a kind of reality. So maybe there could be an interesting convergence of philosophy, VR and imagination here. Love that idea. We'd love to work on that with you. Mm -hmm. We have a few more minutes. I just wanted to open up for questions among some of the folks who are in the room here. Does anybody have a question they'd like to ask David or a comment to share? Raise your digitally real hand. Okay, yes. Yes. Oh, here you. Uh, I am. Fidget. Um, I am Dion in the physical space, and I just wanted to make a comment on the conversation that you just had, sort of mm -hmm. picking apart um, physical versus real. Um, and I and I just immediately thought of what I do. I'm a librarian and archivist by day, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. probably by night too. And yeah. um, the way that we categorize materials that we are working with in digital archiving is you have physical materials and you have digital materials and both mm -hmm. are considered real. And so I think that the mm -hmm. way that you described it, it really translates um, between uh, whether you're talking about materials or you're talking about humans or you're talking about um, <clears throat> excuse me, the environment in which we all exist. Um, I like your physical versus digital instead yeah. of, you know, everything is real. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, that makes total sense. I think the more someone has actually worked in digital environments, the more I think this is common sense. So for someone like you, this is probably you know, totally obvious that the digital materials are just as real as the uh, the physical materials. I think likewise with, you know, kids these days who grow up with, uh, with virtual worlds. Um, I think it's just, you know, for them, it's just kind of obvious that those can be genuine realities for you know for old people old people like me i don't know how old this avatar is but in the in the physical world i'm in my 50s um yeah people my age are just like okay it takes them a while to uh, to come around to the idea that virtual reality is is genuine reality but i think it I hope it's one of these things that will gradually become common sense as the technology becomes ubiquitous thank you thanks fidget Hello. Hi. Yes. Hey. Um, yeah, this is really fascinating. Um, uh, my name is Steve and a fan of the Clark Center for many years. Um, you talk a lot about the reality of the digital space and the digital objects. And one of the biggest differences is how easy it is to copy a digital object versus a physical object, you know. Do you think yep. that with the technologies, cryptographic technologies like NFT, does that make a difference? Does that help make digital things even more real or more, more have more existence? They're hard to copy. Yeah, that's a complex question. I really like the fact of digital objects that they're somewhat fungible, very easily 
duplicatable. You know, digital objects in general are rather trivial to uh, to copy. And I think this actually may have consequences inside virtual worlds. You know, say politically and for issues like equality and distributive justice. Um, you know, David Hume, great philosopher, and also John Rawls both said scarcity is a condition for justice. Basically, we get a lot of injustice because objects are scarce. Say material goods are scarce. You know, it's difficult and expensive, say, to build a house in the physical world. So shelter is very unequally distributed. Inside virtual worlds, it's kind of trivial in principle to, to duplicate a house. You know, that um, anybody can have a nice house in principle. You can have your own planet in principle. That offers opportunity of, you know, a kind of virtual abundance. I don't think this suddenly makes all the problems of inequality and injustice go away, but I think it's really central, useful feature of, uh, of VR, that you know, the equivalence of material goods in VR could be abundant. On the other hand, there are all these mechanisms. Of course, you know, the, uh, the whole market-based system kind of thrives on virtual, on scarcity. If everything is abundant, there's not much for uh, for markets to do. So we need scarcity. A market-based system is going to need to create different kinds of artificial scarcity, even in a uh, virtual world. So I guess I see the NFT, the non-fungible token, as one mechanism to create a kind of artificial scarcity. Say this one is, you know, is the original. It's a real thing, and you don't have the right, for example, to uh, to duplicate it. Now, I don't think NFTs can do that on their own. They need to do it in the context of things like copyright and social conventions and so on. So, I mean, I'd like to think that some degree of non-fungibility, maybe of certain special goods, coexist with some degree of fungibility. But I'm not sure. Yeah, it's an interesting question whether somehow in the object of an NFT makes you more real. Maybe it's one way of designating a certain entity as the original. If you view copies as less real than the original, then, uh, then maybe the NFT could play that role. Sure, I want to say, though, in general, that copies are less real. We can clone Dolly the sheep to get a new sheep. Okay, it's not the original, but I think it's still real. And I guess I'd take that attitude to copies in a, uh, in a digital world as well. Great answer. Thank you. Well, David, it's just such a pleasure to have you here with us. Um, one of the things we've learned about current state of virtual worlds is people having headsets on for a very long time start to make them quite tired. But I thought I might wrap up with a quote from your book. Um, this is where you talk about Dumbledore's dictum. This is spoken mm -hmm. by Hogwarts headmaster Albus Dumbledore towards the end of the Harry Potter series. Albus Dumbledore says to Harry Potter, of course it's happening inside your head, Harry, but why on earth should that mean it's not real? thoughts and experience happen inside your head and depend on your mind. This is now David Chalmers, not Albus, D Albus Dumbledore. Your thoughts and experience happen inside your head and depend on your mind, but they're real all the same. Social entities like money also depend on people's minds. If no one regarded dollar bills as valuable, they wouldn't be money, but money is real all the same. So reading your book has really taken me to this um, fascinating introspection about what is the threshold of reality nexus point where reality meets reality you know is digital reality really any different than physical reality really appreciate the work you've done on this topic and thank you so much for being here with us oh thanks cassie for the great conversation and the uh, and the questions too it's been super okay, interesting and, yeah and everyone make sure to check out david's book reality plus which is out now. Be sure to give it some great reviews. And um, you can also find David at consc.net, the beginning of the word consciousness, consc.net. Thanks again, David.